All right. Well, um, just as with the other talks, just stop me whenever you want to ask questions, okay? You're a little bit small for me to see, so just wave your hand or something um, because I can't see your faces too well. Now, I thought there were three of you, but I'm only seeing two now. They left. Uh, you've got your two participants, and then David and Nock may come back, but I think the two people who came to the lecture are here. Okay, perfect. All right. Um, and, and may I just introduce myself? Um, I, uh, uh, the, one, the second person who showed up, hi, how are you, and, and what, what's your name, and um, did you come to the two last year? Hi, um, I'm Dawn. I came to the second of the two last year. Okay. Okay, perfect. But my background right. is in well, environmental science, so some of it's familiar. Perfect. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Well, first of all, I want to thank both of you uh, for coming uh, today um, in spite of this weather. Uh, if it's any consolation, we, uh, we're also having a uh, big snowstorm here. Um, but I'm sure that it's, well, I know it's not as cold uh, as it is up there. So um, uh, I, uh, I thank you for weathering the, the storm to get here. Um, as, uh, as we've been discussing, last year in March, I did two, uh, two talks, the first one on what is crude oil and the second one on what happens when crude oil gets into water. And as a result of those talks, um, we had a discussion with the participants, and two topics uh, kind of came up uh, that people were interested in. One was biodegradation of crude oil, and the second one was dispersants and dispersed oil. And I'm going to be doing that talk on Saturday, uh, February 1st, uh, same time and same time of the day. And that one may take, um, that may take, uh, we may decide to break that into two, but at least we'll, we'll make a good effort at trying to do it in one session. So um, what I'm going to do this week is just have a brief, brief review of what we talked about, some of the aspects of what we talked about last time uh, back in March of 2013 that may be applicable, and then jump into the biodegradation. And if you can't see the slides or if I'm going too fast or whatever, please just stop me, okay? Um, okay. So what I want We're to good. talk about first, okay, good, is uh, the composition of crude oil and just uh, as a little refresher. And you'll remember that last year when we talked about this, we said that crude oil was made up of hundreds of chemical compounds and that the two things that the chemical compounds um, really consisted of uh, were carbon and hydrogen. And that's why sometimes these compounds are called hydrocarbons. And basically the carbon compounds um, were about 80 to 90 percent of uh, the molecules and about Hydrogen was about 10 to 15, and then there can be a whole bunch of other things in there. And you'll remember that we said that these compounds that are in crude oil go from really, really small things like, oh, methane and that kind of thing, up to gigantic compounds, which are have hundreds of uh, carbons in them and are the components of things like asphalt. So what I wanted to do is just review what these compounds are because they're going to, that's going to become important when we talk about biodegradation and how the microbes do the biodegradation, okay? So we can break these compounds down into a couple of different categories. What I will call just simple chains with single bonds, okay? So here are some examples. Um, methane is one, and methane has 
one carbon and four hydrogens. Butane, which is another gas, notice has 10 hydrogens and four carbons, one, two, three, four. But the key thing here is to notice that the bonds between these carbons are all single bonds, okay? Now, both methane and butane are what we would call straight chains, and you can see why that is. It's just a single chain in a row. But you can also get things like isobutane, which basically is where the carbons start branching off of each other. Now, you'll notice all the bonds between the carbons are single bonds, okay? But the carbons are branching. It's not a nice little chain. It's really something that looks more like this, with the hydrogens hanging off of it, okay? Now, if you can think about these kinds of compounds and think about if you were eating them, all right, and you were eating them by chunking off pieces, these would be pretty easy to chunk off, right? You can just go chunk, 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 all right? Now, when you get something like these compounds, these now are rings with single bonds, all right? So here are the carbons again. Here's one carbon, two carbons, three carbons, four carbons, five carbons, six carbons, hence the word hexane. But this is called cyclohexane because notice it's in a little ring here, all right? So you can see the carbons, single bonds, but now instead of being in a straight chain or branched, they are in a ring, okay? A very simple ring. And here's another example of a ringed compound. But these are very simple rings. We can then start looking at simple rings, okay, but with double bonded carbons. So you'll notice that these carbons have two bonds between them. This one has one, these two have two, two, so now we've got the, some of the carbons held very tightly to each other. Instead of being held just by a single bond, they're held together by a double bond. And if you can think about this, this kind of a ring is going to be a really tight ring. Okay? It's going to be hard to break open. As opposed to this ring, this simple ring with these single bonds. Now, if you go back and think about, here's our simple chains with single bonds, and if we're going to have some, an organism degrade these, it can just take off little chunks, right? Just cleave off little chunks, chop them off. But when you get a ring, that's harder to do because there's no place really to kind of chop off because everything's in a ring, all right? And when you get a ring with these double bonds in it, now the, that ring is held even tighter together. So it's going to be even more difficult to degrade. And then you can see that these are multiple rings with double bonds. And you can get compounds like some of these, like this one that you can see here, where you've got these very, very, very <coughs> tight double bonded structures, multiple rings really, really hard to degrade. And we're going to see that come to the front uh, as we talk a little bit through biodegradation. But this is all stuff we learned last or talked about last time. Uh, it's just in a slightly different context. Okay? Question? Any questions? No, we're good. Okay. All right. Now, the other thing we talked about last time is crude oil characteristics. And we decided that crude oils vary from place to place and over time from the same place. So if we were to look at the crude oils in Prudhoe Bay versus the crude oils down in Cook Inlet um, versus the crude oils down in Louisiana, we would see that those crude oils were different in, in their composition and in the amount of sulfur they had in them, and a whole bunch of other things. And if we look at a well that's pumped for a long time versus a well that's only just started pumping, we also see a difference over time in the uh, characteristics of the oil. 
and we talked about that last time. But some important characteristics that I want to just point out are the density of the oil, and remember we talked about this last time and said that typically one gram of water, uh, or, or if you had a milliliter of water, and remember five mils are one teaspoon, so if we had a milliliter of water it would weigh about one gram. Crude oil is a little bit lighter. It's between about 0.8 to 0.9 grams per milliliter. So what happens is that crude oil tends to float on water because it's less dense. Okay? Now that's going to also turn out to be important later on when we talk about biodegradation because oil and water are not going to mix that well. All right, so we're going to have a layer of oil, and it's going to be hard for the microbes to access it. Okay, another important characteristic that we talked about last time was the solubility. And remember, we said that the solubility of a compound, of an oil, com a compound within an oil, uh, is going to be telling us about that compound's ability to dissolve into water, okay, to actually go into the water and be soluble in the water. And we said that most of the compounds in oil don't dissolve well in water, but they do dissolve to a small extent. So I gave you an example last time. I said, for example, if we look at sugar, you can have about one pound of sugar dissolved in a cup of water. If you look at crude oil, one pound of oil would need 200 uh, to 300 million gallons of water to dissolve into. It's really not very soluble, okay? And the key thing to remember about this is that microbes prefer to eat things that are dissolved in water. That's what they like to do. They can eat things that are on a surface or in a slick, but they don't do that as well as they do when something's dissolved in water, okay? And these oil compounds do dissolve, but only to a limited extent. Okay, any questions on that? Well, I'm just remembering all those pictures when the deep water horizon was happening and the, you know, all that oil was going out into water, I mean, it, I, I thought I heard that some of it you and didn't get up to the surface and instead went other places or something like that. And I'm assuming, obviously, I, I, they weren't using dispersants, I guess, but I, I got the impression that it would be bef would just happening initially before even the, the, the dispersants were used. Was that just uh, not realizing that later it all floated to the surface or what? Okay, what actually happened, and we'll talk about this a little next time, is that there, there, that dispersion can happen naturally if you have a lot of turbulence, okay? And down there at the bottom, they had a lot of turbulence because that oil was shooting out with a great force, okay? It was flying out of there. And so there was a lot of natural turbulence. And we'll talk about some other factors, but... Basically, that oil became tiny, tiny little droplets. And so it actually, some of it did go to the surface, but, and when they added the dispersant, then less of it went to the surface. But you can also have natural dispersion because of turbulence. And in dispersion, what you do is form tiny, tiny droplets of oil instead of a slick. Okay? Did okay, that thank answer you. it? Okay, any other questions? Uh, yeah. Other questions? No, we're okay. good. We're good. All right. So just the last thing that I want to review before we start on the nitty-gritty of biodegradation is what happens when crude oil gets into water? And we talked about all the natural processes, and I'm not going to go through them in great detail, but we basically use this picture that you can see here, 
as a kind of indicator of all of the different processes that could happen, like uh, evaporation and stuff dissolving into the water and stuff settling and, and biodegradation and all sorts of things, okay? And we said that with the, what's going to happen, which one of these processes is going to happen, and how fast they're going to happen, is a function of the oil type and its characteristics, the air and water temperature, the wind, the waves, the tides, and the currents. And we talked about that all last time. All right? But what we were able to do is come up with kind of a summary of all of the different processes and the key processes and how long they took and what percentage of the oil they accounted for, all right? Now, this is natural processes, natural weathering of the oil. So if we look here, the process that occurred, that occurs really rapidly in the first one to 10 days is evaporation. So some of those compounds zip up into the air, okay? And they become in, in, the, in the atmosphere. Some of them dissolve into the water, and that again happens in the first 10 days or so. But you can see, percentage-wise, only about 5% of the oil dissolves into the water, and about 25% typically evaporates. Then we have the breakdown by sunlight, and that happens over 10 to 100 days, and again, that accounts for about 5% of the oil. Biodegradation, which we're going to talk about today, look at the time frames this occurs in. It, can, it occurs over long periods of time, from day 50 to day 500, and accounts for about 30% of the oil. And then disintegration and sinking is from about... 100 days to 1,000 days, and that's about 15%. And then the residual wool, which can be tar balls, et cetera, is about 20% of the oil. So this is in a typical spill, OK? Any questions on that? Question. Yep, yep. question. Uh, uh, I'm assuming open ocean on all of these time periods. Yes, and the time periods are going to vary, too, based on the temperature, okay? Right. Now, that was my question, Any? too, I mean, in terms of the temperature. So are these, are these you know, the Gulf of Mexico is one thing and the Chukchi Sea is another. <laughs> I mean, are these kind of average worldwide or, or, and the same thing with sun, of course, we don't have it. <laughs> Still don't, it's coming right. up on the 21st, but. Uh, Right. And so, again, these are just, as we talked about last time, these are general processes. And sometimes the, if you're under ice or um, a lot of other factors may, may dictate that you don't have very much of these. Um, you'll still have some evaporation, even though it's very cold. Um, you'll have dissolution. Uh, obviously, if you don't have sun, you will not have photochemical degradation. We, we have, the literature shows that you will get some biodegradation. I mean, where the biodegradation occurred in the Gulf of Mexico, it, the water was about four degrees centigrade. It was down deep, most of that occurred. Um, so you will get some of these, but it will be a function of the temperature, okay? Yeah, I missed that last sentence that what, what happened down deep and how, what the temperature was? In the Gulf of Mexico, during the Deepwater Horizon, um, the biodegradation that was measured, um, a lot of biodegradation occurred on that part of the oil, as you mentioned, that stayed down deep, okay? And it's about four degrees centigrade down deep in the Gulf of Mexico. I know it doesn't seem like it would be. The top of the water column is very, very hot or warm, 
but the lower part is about four degrees centigrade. And that's where a large amount of biodegradation occurred. So it, it doesn't mean at low temperatures that you won't get biodegradation. And I'll talk about why you can get biodegradation at low temperatures. It's basically a function of acclimation. Okay. Thank you. Real quickly, one more thing. Uh, your pathways there are established by Butler in 1976. I'm assuming that the, the values you've got here, however, are current ones or ones that you're saying are uh, a la the, uh, the spill in the Gulf? Well, they're not, they're not specific to the spill in the Gulf, but they are the ranges that we would see um, that could be uh, existing in, in a bunch of different spills. So that's why you see these ranges going from 10 to 100 days, right? If you have very little amount of sunlight, uh, that breakup is going to be taking a long time. If you have just, uh, let's say, in the northeast uh, in the winter time, We don't have that much sun here. The sun uh, only is up for a short amount of time. Um, it isn't very strong, so the, bio, the, the rate of photochemical degradation is going to take a lot longer than it would in the Gulf of Mexico in the summertime. And those okay? time scales have been confirmed since Butler? Oh, yes. There's, there's been a whole range of work done on it, yes. Okay. Thanks. But again, these are ranges. I, I wouldn't want you to say oh, I'm going to go to a spill tomorrow and I'm going to measure and it's going to be these numbers. It, it might not be. I mean, it, it'll be in these of ranges course. most likely. Okay? You bet. Any other questions? Well, just real quick, the, the, like the, the, there's, there's the residue. Is, is, are the tar balls that, you know, were on the Gulf beaches, so is, is that an example of the residue? or? Yes, yes. Yep. And you can go um, into the, the Sargasso Sea, for instance, in the Atlantic, and you can see uh, tar balls that are there uh, from releases from long ago. And what it is is those compounds that are present are these compounds here that are the tar-like compounds, right? These very, very large rings, multiple rings, that just don't degrade. They don't volatilize. They don't degrade photochemically. They don't biodegrade. Um, you know, they don't dissolve in water. So they're just left around. And basically what happens is that you get, in, you get this weathering and you basically get these tar balls <clears throat> that are the residue that remains. Okay? Uh, thank you. Okay. All right. So that's our little overview. Um, what I want to do now is to jump into the crude oil biodegradation. And I've got some key concepts that I'm going to talk about uh, over, over the time that we're, uh, we're doing this. Um, and the key things to remember are that microbes, microorganisms or microbes can degrade compounds in crude oil. What they do is they use those compounds for generating energy. But in some cases, Biodegradation doesn't happen, and I'm going to talk about what those cases are, okay? The second thing to remember is that microorganisms degrade compounds, the, or, the compounds in oil, at different rates. Not all compounds degrade at the same rate. So to the microbes, the oil is not a big, um, just a they aren't eating oil, they're eating the specific compounds within the oil. And they don't eat each of those compounds at the same rate. Okay? And the other thing to remember, the third thing to remember is that those microbes need other things besides the oil compounds to live. 
and to generate energy. Okay? So those are the three big concepts that I want you to keep in mind. All right? Okay. So what microbes do the degradation? Well, those microbes are typically, we typically call them bacteria. There are some other kinds of very specialized um, microbes that are called archaea, which are very, very old. Um, and Kathy, do we have any water that are very, very old uh, in, in time? Um, but the big ones that we're going to focus on are these bacteria. And they're single cells, and they have chromosomes. Um, their genes, thank you. Their genes are present, but they're not in a membrane-bound nucleus. They don't have a nucleus like we have. The other thing to remember is it's not algae or plants that are doing the degradation. It's these microbes, these bacteria, OK? And I just threw this slide up here because there are lots and lots and lots of different organisms that degrade oil compounds. And this is just a tiny little list of a few compounds, uh, and you can see the list is long. And it's, it's even longer now uh, that we are starting to do uh, what we call metagenomics for looking at these organisms. So there are hundreds of them that can do degradation of oil compounds. We, so we can't really want, read that slide. I mean, I don't know if you want to just read off what you circled real quick, oh, but we can't, are, it's too are, small to. These are just different compounds in the oil, OK? And these are the names, the Latin names of some of the organisms. And what, I, what I'll do is, um, and I think we did this last time too, didn't we, David? I, I'll send the slides up. David, did we do that last time? Um, oh, maybe David, David isn't uh, there. stepped out, but Doc is here. He'll carry okay. the message. Okay. <laughs> anyway, they have just all looking, these... Just looking at the table, I was just going to say, just looking at the table, it does appear that the, uh, the microorganisms are discrete as to the class of contaminant that they're working on. Yes, but something like Pseudomonas uh, putida, it will work on straight chains as well. There just aren't any straight chains listed here. Okay? I see. The only reason I was mentioning that is it would seem like one would have to either have a wide variety of microorganisms or alternatively would have to choose the particular microorganisms you're sowing into the spill to be able to get the most effective uh, degrading. And, and we're going we're gonna to get to that, OK? So the first thing I want to do is talk a little bit about how the microbes are degrading the oil. And what they're mostly doing is generating energy. And so they're using these oil compounds to survive and grow, all right? Now, when you look at these organisms that I've listed in, or that are in this table, these organisms grow in a variety of environments, all right? They're not just eating oil. But if a, bu if a bunch of oil comes along, they may switch and use that oil as a source of energy, OK? Now, if you think about seawater, seawater doesn't have a whole lot of organic carbon in it. And so if you put oil in it, the microbes may have now a source of organic matter to degrade, okay, to, gen to use to generate energy. But they're not used to doing that because especially, uh, let's say, in the uh, northern Chukchi Sea, they probably don't see a whole lot of oil. In the Gulf of Mexico, that's different because there's a lot of natural seeps in the Gulf of Mexico. So, the, so that the microbes in the deep water of the Gulf of Mexico can see oil all the time. Because it's estimated that about 20 million gallons a year uh, of oil seeps 
into the Gulf of Mexico. So 20 million gallons of oil is quite a lot of oil to just be on natural seeps going up from the ocean floor. Okay? So you don't see that as much uh, off of where you live. Now, I'm not talking about where there might be drilling going on uh, over near, um, near Prudhoe Bay, but I'm talking about offshore where there wouldn't be much oil. Okay? Okay. So what I'm going to talk about now is not unique to microbes. This is something that the process that I'm going to talk about for energy generation that the microbes use is very similar to what you're doing and I'm doing when we eat organic carbon. We're just doing it with carbohydrates or lipids, not with oil. We don't degrade oil, but the microbes are a lot more, um, a lot more uh, generalists, and they can use a lot of different organic carbon compounds. Okay, so basically the way energy is generated is by transferring electrons from one compound to another. All right? So right now, as I'm sitting here moving my hands around, I need to generate energy to make my muscles go, etc. The way I'm doing that is before I sat down here, I took in some sugar, some glucose. And my body took that glucose in, and now my cells are taking the glucose and basically stripping electrons off of it and passing those electrons down a little chain and getting energy out of them, okay? And that's exactly what the microbes do with the oil compounds, okay? By transferring electrons from the oil compounds to an electron acceptor. So in order to do this, you have to have something that donates electrons, which basically is losing them, and something that accepts electrons or gains electrons. And the donor is called the electron donor, and the acceptor is called the electron acceptor. Okay? So basically, what you've got is an electron donor plus an electron acceptor, and what you get is an oxidized electron donor and a reduced electron acceptor. You go, oh my God, I don't remember what that is. All right. All it means is that the electron donor gives its electrons to the electron acceptor. That's all you have to remember. And in doing that, energy is generated. And the electron donor has less electrons, and the electron acceptor ends up with more electrons. Okay? Everybody set. Okay, so here's an example. Our old, friend, <coughs> glu whoops, our old friend glucose that I just had a bunch of before my talk today. There it is, glucose. Six carbons, 12 hydrogens, six oxygens. And oxygen is what I'm using as my electron acceptor. It's what you're using too, because I think you're breathing up there, right? So you're digesting your lunch or whatever you've eaten, and you're using oxygen to do it. And so the glucose gives up the electrons to the oxygen. The oxygen accepts them, and it ends up becoming water. And we won't go into the nitty-gritty of it. And the glucose ends up without hydrogens and electrons. So it's just the original oxygens and the carbon. And we generate lots and lots of energy doing this. And we're doing it constantly. That's how your heart keeps beating, because the muscle cells need energy. And chunk, 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 chunk. They're using energy from whatever you've eaten. OK? Any questions on that? So the key is we need an electron donor, and we need an electron acceptor. So do the organisms to degrade oil. The oil compound is the electron donor. It's going to give off those hydrogens and electrons. And the oxygen is the preferred electron acceptor. So the oxygen that's dissolved in seawater is what is the electron acceptor that the microbes use, preferentially. 
because you get lots and lots of energy. And what they form is CO2 and water and energy. And the bacteria are what is doing this. Okay? Everybody's set. Mm -hmm. Now, the energy generation is a three-step process. The first step, and we do this too, is you take that organic carbon molecule, all right, and you basically break it into pieces. This is really just a little preparatory step, okay? It's like taking and making uh, carrots, all right? If you were going to cook up carrots, what you do is you take the long carrot and you go chop, 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 and you break the carrot into little pieces. That's basically what's happening in this first step of the process. There's very, very little energy generated. It's just a preparatory step. The organism's taking the oil compound and going chop, 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 chop. Okay? The second step is called the tricarboxylic acid cycle. Don't worry about that. Just know that basically in this step what happens is the hydrogens and the electrons get pulled off of those carbon or of those oil molecules. And remember, those oil molecules are just carbons and hydrogens. We looked at those early on. That's all it is. And so in this step, it's just pulling the hydrogens and electrons off. Okay? Again, it's a preparatory step, and some energy is generated, but not a whole lot. It's in this last step, the third step, where the energy is really generated. And this is called the electron transport system. There's no organic molecule left. The oil molecules, the compounds, have been chopped up, and the hydrogens and electrons have been stripped off of them. All that happens in this step is that the electrons that came off that molecule are being passed down a chain. It's like a bucket brigade. Okay? Like handing it from one person to another person to another person. If we were all in the same room, I'd have you get up and we'd, we'd demonstrate this. Okay? But we're not all in the same room, so be glad of that. <laughs> and what, what we need at the end of this chain is something to take those electrons, because you can't just have free electrons floating around in your cells. It's not a good idea. So the electron acceptor is sitting there at the end of the chain and takes the electrons. Okay? All right. So here's how it works. Where it occurs in the bacteria that we're talking about is in the cell membrane. Now, in, in us, it occurs in the mitochondria. But in the bacteria that do the degradation of the oil, it occurs in the cell membrane. All right? So here's the organic carbon molecule. We've stripped off the hydrogens and the electrons. And here comes the electron, comes down into the cell membrane, and it goes to this first little thing here, which just is an electron carrier. It's a compound that's sitting inside the cell membrane. Okay? And it passes the electron to that carrier. All right? And that carrier passes the electron along to the next one. And in the process, there's energy generated. Then the next one. Then the next one. Then the next one. So the electron has gone bing, 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 down the chain, generating energy. And then in the last step, it's, the electron is passed out of the cell membrane to the electron acceptor, which in this case is oxygen. And there's more energy generated. Okay? So that's called the electron transport system. And you're doing it, and I'm doing it right now. And it's the same exact thing that bacteria do, only the organic carbon compound that they're using up here, where they're first chopping it into pieces and then stripping off the hydrogens and electrons, that's, that is done with an oil compound as opposed to glucose. All right? Now, the electron acceptor has to be brought into the cell across the cell membrane. So the oxygen starts off 
outside the cell, okay? And it has to be brought in inside the cell. I'll find my pen here, which I don't know what I did with it. Well, any, oh, here it is. So the oxygen has to come from outside the cell, out in the water, across the cell membrane to inside the cell. It sits at the end of the electron transport system. It accepts the electrons, and then it leaves the cell. Okay? Everybody set. All right? Okay. So, you wonder why I'm going into all this. Well, the key thing to remember is there's a very special order here in the way things happen. Because if we look at these transfers, let's just call this compound A and B and this one C, okay, and this one we'll call D, etc. All right? It turns out that if we look at A and B, this is the key thing to remember. We can only transfer electrons if the receiver has a greater affinity for the electrons than the donor. Okay? So if we go back here and look, it turns out that B, that compound that's sitting in the cell membrane, that's sitting in there, has a greater affinity for electrons than A. C has a greater affinity for electrons than B. And if you remember way, way, way back to chemistry, you might remember that oxygen has a really great affinity. It loves electrons. It loves them. Okay? And so that's why having oxygen at the end here is really, really good because oxygen is highly electrophilic. It loves electrons. Organic carbon doesn't like them so much. All right? But the key is that the compounds that we make these transfers to A, and then B, and then C, and then D, and then E. E has a greater affinity for electrons than D. D has a greater affinity than C. C has a greater affinity than B. And A has the lowest affinity of everything except organic carbon. Oxygen has a really high, high, high affinity for electrons. Everybody got it now? So that's why oxygen well, is such question, a great electron. Yeah. Just yeah. a question. I mean, so uh, are these A, B, C, D, and E somehow preparing the electrons so they can be accepted by the oxygen? Otherwise, they wouldn't be? Or why all those steps before, it, before they get taken up by the oxygen? Okay, now I'm going to show you something, and that's a really perceptive question. All right, now, here's an example. Here's A, B, C, D, and E, okay? Now, suppose oxygen is not present in the environment, okay? So let's just say, for whatever reason, there just isn't a lot of oxygen. Sometimes in mud, uh, you'll see this, all right, at the bottom of, of a muddy, muddy pond or something. There's not very much oxygen. Or I don't know if, you, um, if you've ever been to a mud flat, um, and sometimes in the, in the, in the warm summer months, on a mud flat on a, on a seashore, you'll smell hydrogen sulfide, that rotten egg smell. Do you, ever, do you ever get that up there? I think I smelled it 
Bristol Bay. Right? Yeah, I was going to say, not here, but a little farther south where it gets warmer. Okay. So in that case, seawater has a lot of this compound in it. This compound is called sulfate. Okay? And seawater has a lot of sulfate. But sometimes in the mud, there isn't very much oxygen. So what happens is sulfate can accept electrons. Okay? But sulfate doesn't have as high an affinity for electrons as oxygen. In fact, it not only doesn't have as high an affinity as oxygen, it, it doesn't, it has, um, it could not take electrons from C. It's less electrophilic than C. So you have to short circuit the system here. B can pass to sulfate, okay? But C couldn't pass to sulfate. So what ends up happening is you get less energy when there is an oxygen present, all right? So you have to have, as a microbe, you have to have A, B, C, D, and E, all right? Because normally you want to use oxygen, but when oxygen's been used up and you have to use sulfate, then you, ca you can't just go from A to E, you've got to have B as an intermediate. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, does it make sense? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> yeah, it's the difference, difference between anaerobic and aerobic metabolism. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. All right? And the key is that if you do something like using sulfate as an electron acceptor, you're not going to get as much energy and the microbes are going to grow more slowly and you're going to get less biodegradation. All right? So most of the time what you're going to see is oxygen as an electron acceptor. But if you go down to the Exxon Valdez or to the um, Prince William Sound and you dig down into the mud, you'll still find oil that hasn't degraded. You can see that in a lot of different places. Even though the oil is fairly fresh, it's not those heavy, heavy only those heavy, heavy compounds. The compounds could be biodegraded, but there's no oxygen present. So the process is very, very slow. There's not much energy generated. The organisms grow very slowly. See what I'm saying? Questions on that? Okay, so that's really important. We're good. If we have, yeah, go ahead. No, we're good. Okay. All right. So this just gives you a little hierarchy of a little idea about how much energy you generate. So if you use oxygen as the electron acceptor and the byproduct formed is water, you generate lots of energy. If you use CO2 as the electron acceptor and generate methane, you, use, you generate very little energy. So the organisms that use oxygen do the work faster and they do the work more completely than the ones that, that do sulfate reduction. Here's sulfate. You don't tend to see much with nitrate because this is pretty well absent from seawater. So you don't get much of this. This is not present in seawater. So you don't get that, and there's not a whole lot of iron either. So the key things you get in, in seawater are your oxygen, your sulfate, 
and if you don't have sulfate methanogenesis. But the, the key ones are really these two. All right? And these two here are mostly seen in mud. Any questions? Okay? All right. Now, all of these reactions are, are mediated, are helped by enzymes. And the enzymes are specialized for these reactions. Okay? And the key thing to remember is that the cells make the enzymes when the compound it, that the electron donor, the specific electron donor, is present. Now, obviously, if crude oil isn't present all the time, then the organisms, the microbes, are not going to be generating the enzymes they need to do the degradation of oil. So one of the key things we tend to see is that it takes a while. There's a lag, and I'll mention this again later. There's a lag when you put oil into water because the organisms aren't just sitting around generating a whole bunch of enzymes that they wouldn't normally be using. So the presence of the oil can trigger the production of the enzymes needed to do the different steps of chopping up the mic molecules, okay? Any questions on that? Okay, so again, to review, the oil compound is the electron donor, and the amount of energy that's generated is a function of the type of oil compound, the electron acceptor that's used, and the enzymes that are available. All right? So those are the three things that are going to be really important in dictating the amount of energy that's generated. Okay. So the oil compound serves as food to create the energy, but not all the compounds are going to be degraded at the same rate. The simple chains are easier than the rings. Remember the rules that we talked about. And for the most part, oxygen, except in mud and a few other environments, is going to be the electron acceptor. Okay, so remember what we said when we started this whole discussion, um, and that was that if we had simple chains with single bonds, the organisms could just chop chop them into pieces, right? Little simple pieces, or cleave off little pieces like that, and those could go into the, these are, this is happening in the preparatory steps, and then the hydrogens and electrons can be stripped off, okay? When you have a ring, these are the simple rings with the single bonds. The first thing you have to do is break the ring. Because remember, the organisms like to do this chunka, 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 cutting pieces off. And when you have a ring, it's hard to cut off pieces. So you've got to open up the ring. So the first thing they need to do is open the ring. Okay? So they're going to open the ring. And there's a special enzyme to open the ring. But that enzyme isn't produced until the compounds are present. Okay? Now, when you get double bonds, it's much harder to break the ring. So, in this particular case, they actually have to kind of stick some things onto the ring and then break it open. Okay? So they have to change these little functional groups that stick off here. There's a hydrogen off here. That they have to change those and then break this ring open. And when you have multiple rings, it's even more difficult. So there's basically a hierarchy in which compounds they'll like to break down. Whoa, these ones with single bonds and simple chains, easier. Okay? Okay. 
Now, here's the problem with those, though, when we think about it. When we look at many of these compounds, what are they? They're the compounds that volatilize the easiest out of the oil. So sometimes these compounds with the simple chains, they aren't even available. They just fly up into the air. The rings, the simple rings, a little harder to degrade. And then these double rings, much harder to degrade. And obviously, these multiple rings with double bonds are hell to degrade. Okay? Now, I like to say to my students, if you think about this, it's totally logical. All right? This is like me giving you a plate. And on the plate, you have sugar, very easy to degrade and get energy from it. You have I don't know uh, what you might think is difficult to degrade, but let me just say, um, oh, I don't know, uh, tripe. Do you guys ever eat tripe, stomach? <laughs> I don't know if you eat the stomach of the whale or anything like that, but some people eat stomach. That's harder to degrade because it's tough material. And then what if I put down bone, and I put down uh, bark. Those would be really tough to degrade. Now, they're made of organic material, but they're much harder to degrade. So which one are you going to degrade first? You're going to degrade the one that's easiest to degrade. And that's what you see, preferential degradation. OK? Any questions on that? All right, so those are kind of the basics. Those are the generalizations and the basics. But on top of all of that, we have other factors that affect biodegradation. And there are many. I'm just going to go over the highlights of some of them, OK? So for example, there are other substances that the cell needs. There are abiotic factors, such as temperature. Interaction between substrates, effect of other biological processes, bioavailability, recalcitrance, and acclimation. All right. So, cells need water. Now, I'm only adding this in here because there is, um, there have been spills of oil on land up, I know, up in the uh, North Slope. And so, one of the tough things is, Cells need available water to do degradation. Now, obviously, in seawater, this is not a problem. They also need nutrients, and they need two types of nutrients, two categories. One are macronutrients, which means they need large quantities of those. And those are things like nitrogen and phosphorus. Then there are micro quantities, or micronutrients, which are things they need just a little bit of. And some of these are things that you would never even think of. They're things like molybdenum and vanadium and zinc and copper. They need very, very tiny amounts of those. If there's too much, it's toxic. But they need tiny amounts. And what they need them for usually is those, are, those metals are oftentimes the heart of the enzymes. So anyway, they need those. And everything has to be in just the right form for them to use. So it's, it can be quite complex. But basically, they need nutrients and they need water. Now, temperature is also a big impact of the abiotic factors, which include pH and a whole bunch of other things that I'm not going to go into. Temperature is the biggest one. And this affects enzyme activity. It, it affects the rate at which these, these reactions occur. All right? It affects the way or the, uh, how fast an enzyme can, can help a reaction occur. 
And the typical rule of thumb is that for every 10 degrees C, 10 degrees Celsius increase in temperature, the enzyme activity or the rate at which the reaction occurs <coughs> doubles. Okay? That's the typical uh, kind of rule of thumb. Now, that's what we used to think. And it's true. If you take an organism and you double the temperature, you can get, or a chemical reaction especially, you can get double the reaction rate. But the key thing that we've learned <coughs> over time is that microbes adapt to the environment in which they live. All right? So that when we look at those microbes that are living all the time in the Gulf of, in the deep part of the Gulf of Mexico, where there's never any light, there's plenty of oxygen, and it's cold all the time, year round, it's four degrees C. All right? Those organisms can do biodegradation fairly quickly. Now, there are arguments about how fast the microbes in the Gulf of, bottom of the Gulf of Mexico can do the degradation or have done the degradation of oil. Some people argue it was 10 days. Some people argue it was three months. Okay? Relatively speaking, the difference between 10 days and 90 days for a microbe is in the noise. But the key thing to note is it's on the order of 10 to 90 days at a cold temperature, 4 degrees. We would never have thought that before. So over the last 10 years, We've gotten more and more and more evidence that shows that we can have cold adapted organisms, that microbes, that can do degradation at cold temperatures. But you don't necessarily see them do those degradations right away. Why? Because they aren't acclimated to degrading oil, right? They're not sitting there degrading oil all the time. So the question might come up, can microbes in the Chukchi Sea degrade oil? And they probably can. The microbes that do those degradations that I showed you are not some kind of weird microbes that you never see any place. They're ones that are fairly ubiquitous, ones that are generally found in the environment. But the question is, will they degrade the oil? Not can they, but will they, in any given circumstance, degrade the oil? Okay? And that's the question. Will they degrade it? And if they will, how fast will they do it? All right? So it's very hard for us to say right now, OK, if we put oil in the Chukchi Sea, oh, it will take months to years to degrade. Because it's a very, very, very complex question. Because we're talking about different types of compounds within the oil. Some we know will not degrade fast at all because they're big, complex, multi-ring structures. And some that might degrade fairly quickly, the microbes are not sitting there making enzymes for something that they haven't been exposed to. So you've got that adaptation. So it's a very, very complex question. But the key thing to note is that the microbes in the Chukchi Sea are cold adapted microbes. They just live in the cold all the time. However, they haven't been exposed to a lot of oil like the ones in the Gulf of Mexico have. Okay? So, what about the interaction between substances? Okay, 
Now this gets to that point that I made earlier. If multiple organic substrates are present, one may be preferred over another. The microbes will go for those compounds that are easiest to degrade first because they're easy to degrade, you generate more energy, they're faster, boom. It's like eating candy as opposed to eating leather. And that's what you'll see. So you will not necessarily, you won't see organisms with oil going in and degrading all of the compounds at the same rate at the same time. They'll go for the easy stuff first, okay? But they are going for what's available to them in the water, right? So when we look at all these compounds, they're going to go for the easy stuff first, the ones that are straight chains, the ones that are single bonds in a ring, okay? The one, and then to maybe the ones that are double bonds, but are smaller molecules as, the one, as opposed to the ones that are these giant molecules with multiple rings, okay? Now, any questions about what I'm saying? Because I know I'm throwing a lot out here. Everybody set? We're good. Mm -hmm. Okay. So another thing about the interaction between substances, what you oftentimes see is that the first substance may enhance the degradation of the second. And we call this synergism sometimes. The, or the byproducts of the first may be needed in the degradation of the second. So here's an example of a synergism. There are many. This is just one. Okay. The bottom line of this is what we talked about earlier, that one organism, in this case Rhodococcus, can degrade this ring. And if you look at this ring, this is a complex ring because here's a ring plus it's got a whole bunch of carbons sitting on it as a little side chain, okay? Now it turns out that Rhodococcus can degrade this compound and whoops, get rid of that. It can degrade it, but look what it does. Look what it does here. It takes this compound, let me just erase this so you can see this a little better. It takes this compound and see what's sitting here? So there are 11 of these little things in a row. 11 carbons in a row, blah, 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 blah. And at the end, the last one has three hydrogens on it. So what this organism does, what Rhodococcus does, is it chops off, it basically chops off all but two of the carbons and it puts on an OOH group, okay, which is an acetic acid. The ring is still the same, but it's basically cleaved off or chopped off a big long section of carbons, which can now be degraded as straight chains. And then Arthrobacter, which is another type of microorganism, can take this and it can degrade it. And it degrades it as one of these ring structures. It breaks the ring open. So the two are working in tandem. Arthrobacter can't do that first step. Rhodococcus can. All right? So that's called a synergism. And we see this a lot in biodegradation of oil compounds, especially of these multi-ring structures, of these big ones. The little ones, not so much, but of these big, complex structures. That's what we see. Okay. Now, the next concept is the one of bioavailability. 
you're not going to get biodegradation unless the compound is available to the microbe. All right? So this is just like me saying, okay, I'm going to put some candy in your house. All right? I could put the candy in a bowl where you could get at it and eat it and degrade it, or I could put the candy in a safe that's locked and you can't get at it. So you can't use it for food. You can't use it for energy. So bioavailability is all about not whether the compounds are present, but how available they are to the <coughs> organism. All right? So in order to be degraded, the oil compound must be available to the microbe. If it isn't dissolved in water, if it's in a slick, or if it's stuck on a surface, like on particles of silt, something like that, it's going to be less, less available to the microbe and therefore not as readily biodegraded. This is one of the reasons why oil spill responders like to disperse oil into little droplets, which is what we talked about, Judge, at the beginning of the, of the time, right? So dispersants, either chemical dispersants or natural dispersion, make the droplet into a tiny, tiny thing that the microbe can attack, as opposed to a big blobby thing. And so that's what bioavailability is all about. So most microbes would prefer to eat the compound once it's dissolved in water and it's highly available to them. But if it's not highly available, if it's in a big long slick or in giant um, blobs, it's going to go very slowly. All right? Now, a term that you see a lot, used a lot, with respect to biodegradation is recalcitrance. And basically, what this means is that the molecule, the compound, is resistant to biodegradation. So it's called recalcitrant. And when you look at some of those um, compounds that we looked at very early on, a lot of these guys over here are called recalcitrant molecules. They're big. They don't tend to biodegrade. They're big, multi-ringed structures with lots and lots of rings and lots and lots of double bonds. So they tend not to degrade. So they're called fairly recalcitrant. Molecular structure affects recalcitrance, as does environmental conditions. So if there was very little oxygen present, if it was very, very cold, and you had tar, or tar balls, biodegradation would be almost non-existent. Okay? The molecules would be considered recalcitrant. Now the other little thing that I want to throw in here is this. When I talked about biodegradation, I talked about the organic compound, the oil compound, plus oxygen, going to CO2 plus water plus energy. All right? Some of these big oil compounds do not get degraded to CO2. Let me give you an example. Going back to this example here. Arthrobacter can degrade this compound. If the compound is multiple rings, the organism may not totally degrade it. It may only cleave it in half, or it may only chop off something that it can degrade. So sometimes, recalcitrance results in 
incompletely degraded oil compounds. Now, the only reason I bring this up is because this is less true in biodegradation of oil, but there are some compounds that are con oil con that are, um, excuse me, contaminants like chlorinated solvents. And when they are incompletely degraded, sometimes they actually form compounds that are more toxic when they get partially degraded. But that's less true in oil. All right? But the key thing to remember is sometimes it doesn't go all the way to this final step and you're left with kind of smaller chunks, but chunks still of, of molecules. Okay, so again, what affects this recalcitrance? Besides the molecule itself, the bioavailability, sometimes it might be degraded if it was in a different environment, but it might not be available to the organism. It might not have the right nutrients present, or you might not have the right organisms present in the chain of, or consortium of organisms that are needed. So lots of things can cause recalcitrance. And it's very complex sometimes to figure out what's going wrong. Any questions so far? Questions? No, we're good. OK. Okay, now one of the things that you're going to see, people are always trying to say, oh, I have microbes that are super and they'll be able to degrade this oil. I can't tell you how many times I have been at meetings and had people come up to me, because I work on biodegradation, saying we have, a, we have this wonderful elixir of of microbes that will degrade oil, okay? You add them, oil will be degraded. And you can see this, EPA has a list uh, of products that can, that can be used in oil spills, and they have a whole bunch of these elixirs of microbes. The question is, are those elixirs really necessary, especially when we're talking about oil? And in most cases, they're not, okay? But why is it that they're not? What people have done is basically just try to mix together naturally occurring organisms, and they typically put them in there with a lot of nutrients. So the, the, the mixture that you buy is the microbes that are needed to do the degradation in high concentrations and the nutrients. All right? And you throw them in. All right, so why does this work? Well, it might work because you're starting with a high concentration of organisms. But the problem is that when you try to add those during an oil spill, the, as we talked about in March of last year, the oil is spreading so fast and you have to get the organisms. Well, they're probably, you're not going to sit around with bags of organisms in barrel waiting for the oil spill that might never occur or might occur two years or five years from now. So you'd have to get the microbes up there to begin with. And all the whole time, the oil is spreading, spreading, spreading. So the question is, is it really useful? And the answer is, there are very few cases where it probably is wise or has an advantage to do adding microorganisms in what's called bioaugmentation. Now there are some examples of certain kinds of organic compounds, not oil usually, where this is useful. But for the most part, it's not for oil. And there are certain reasons for that. And the reasons, the main reasons, are the ones I've given you here. First of all, when you take these organisms, it's just like taking me and putting me in barrow and saying, okay, survive there, Nancy. Well, I am not adapted to living in barrow, right? 
I'm adapted to living in New Hampshire, which is not as cold and not as dark, et cetera, et cetera. All right? So I would not do very well. I wouldn't survive. I'd probably be eaten by the polar bears, right? I'd just walk out of the top of the world uh, restaurant or hotel and just whoop, be eaten by a polar bear. You, on the other hand, would think to look left and right before you went flying out into the street. Also, what we found is that the in situ microbes, the ones that are naturally there, are usually better adapted to the environment. That's the same thing. You take organisms that are in the water, they're adapted to the cold temperatures, they're adapted to the background conditions, and that's usually why we don't have to add microbes. Another thing is that when people add these special microbes, they say, oh, see, all the oil went away. Well, the problem is they don't usually do controls out in the field. And so you never really know whether that special microbe is doing the biodegradation or it's some other thing. So for the most part, this is not going to be something that you'd want to be doing for biodegradation, or is very practical to do for biodegradation up uh, in the North Slope, or in the uh, in the Chukchi or Beaufort. Okay. Now, all things considered, when you do biodegradation, you're going to have an acclimation period. This is the period when the enzymes are gearing up. It's the time between when the oil is spilled and when biodegradation starts to occur. And remember, when we looked at that table way back at the beginning, we said biodegradation, 10 days it might take to start, or even longer. That's that lag phase when the microbes are ginning up or making the enzymes needed for the degradation. If there's a lot of other easy stuff in the water to degrade, they're not going to degrade the oil. Right? If there's a lot of naturally occurring, easily biodegradable organic matter, they're not going to go for oil. They're going to go for the easy stuff. And when they, if they do go for the oil, it's going to be for the simpler compounds. But they're still going to have to have that acclimation period, that lag phase, when they generate the enzymes that, do the, the, that facilitate or that help the reactions happen. Okay? We're getting a message that they're going to pull the connection in a few minutes. Okay. All right. So when you see acclimation occurring, the other thing is that you usually don't have that many organisms sitting there to degrade the oil. So you've got to have, you might have a low initial population in the seawater. And that's another factor that's going to have impacted acclimation. So not only do we have the organisms having to get the enzymes, they, we then have to get a lot of, of worker bees to do the work, to, to eat the oil and to grow on the oil and then to get more organisms to eat the remaining oil. And we've talked a lot about this, these compounds already. And obviously, pre-exposure, this was a big factor in the Deepwater Horizon spill. We know that in the Gulf of Mexico, organisms are pre-exposed to oil. We don't think that's going to be as much the case in the Arctic um, because you don't have a lot of drilling or natural seeps. So this is probably going to be less of a factor for you than it would say down in, um, uh, in an area where they're doing a lot more drilling, like the Gulf. So overall, it's very hard to predict what acclimation periods are going to be like in situ. And we cannot, and I could give you lots and lots of lab studies that have shown lots and lots of rates, but they are usually not indicative of what's going to happen in the real environment. And the rates differ from place to place. So, and that's really a function of the environmental conditions. So it's very, very hard to say how long is it going to take to degrade. So when you see this number, 
50 to 500 days for biodegradation. And maybe 30% of the oil. That's anybody's guess as to what's going to happen in the Arctic. Because all of the factors that I'm talking about have to be weighed in. So, as an example, we did some work up here on biodegradation at 5 degrees centigrade using some samples of seawater that were given to us from the Arctic. And we saw biodegradation over a period of months at 5 degrees centigrade with Arctic seawater, okay? Of some of the more difficult to degrade compounds. But not, you will not see it of those very, very big, bulky compounds, the asphalt type compounds in the oil. Those are almost non-existent biodegradation. So it can happen, it's just going to take a while. Okay, so the last slide is look at the time frame. If you see something happening in a few days, it's probably not biodegradation. Look at the compounds being degraded, the simple ones, then the complex ones. And we can actually look at some of the recalcitrant Hello, this is Chris from Video Conferencing Services. Hi, Chris. I'm sorry about that. Somehow it got scheduled uh, short. Can we can we finish? Yes, or you should be able to. Or did everybody leave? Okay. It looks like everybody in Barrow is still there. Hi. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Um, all right. So um, the quick question, question before we begin. Oh, yes. Uh, I have this scheduled to go till 4. Is that going to go longer or? No, no, I'm just, I have, this is, this is it. Okay, all right. Well, And then continue, I'm just going to answer, yeah, I'm going to answer questions. All right. It's just all of a sudden I, I kept talking and then I realized that there wasn't anybody up there on the top of the screen who looked like they were from Barrow. It was just ah. me looking at myself. All right, then, carry on. Okay. So the question becomes, and I don't know where we lo I lost you, so I'm just going to go to this slide here. So the question becomes, is biodegradation occurring? Is biodegradation what's happening? And lots of times claims are made that biodegradation is occurring. A few giveaways to whether biodegradation is actually what is occurring during an oil spill is to look, first of all, at the time frame, okay? So what's the time frame? If we see compounds disappearing within a day or two, it's not biodegradation because biodegradation doesn't work that fast. We have to have the organisms present. They have to have, create the enzymes, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So if something happens that quickly, it's likely that it's evaporation or breakdown by the sun or any of those kinds of things. But it's not likely to be biodegradation. Okay? If there's just a slick there, it's not likely to be biodegradation because microbes like to work on the dissolved phase, all right? They're not going to work well on a big oil slick. So again, if you see an oil slick going away, it's probably not as a result of biodegradation. If you look at the compounds that are disappearing, if you see compounds that are very simple to great being going away first and then more complex ones, that could be biodegradation. It could also be that the simplest compounds are the ones that tend to go into the air and evaporate. So that unto itself is not an answer. One of the things that we can do to kind of figure out if it might be biodegradation 
is what you do is you ratio, you use a recalcitrant compound in the oil, something that we know doesn't biodegrade well at all. And one such compound is, is something called hopane. And we look at the ratio of, of how much hopane is present, or one of these recalcitrant compounds, to how much of the other compounds are present. And so that can sometimes help us as a trigger of whether it's biodegradation or not, okay? And then we can also do some special lab tests with certain kinds of tracers and things of that nature. But the bottom line is it's hard to tell if biodegradation is occurring without doing some specialized ratios and especially without looking at the time frame and the context. If it's a slick, it's not likely biodegradation. The, the, the biodegradation is going to occur on the very, very tiny droplets of oil if, they're, if oil is dispersed or on the dissolved fraction. And we know right from the beginning of the talk today that very little of this stuff actually dissolves into the water. All right? So. The bottom line is biodegradation of oil compounds can certainly occur, but it's going to be relatively, it's not going to be fast, and it's going to be progressively more difficult in environments where there are low nutrients, where there's very little oxygen, and where you have mostly complex compounds present. like the, the bigger things like the tars and the asphalts, et cetera. Okay, so those are my comments on biodegradation. Um, thanks for participating. I've got my contact info here, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Oh, I can't hear you. Are you saying anything? Uh-oh. I still can't hear you. Oh, we have to call Chris, I think. Oh, there we go. Oh, I think there I, we go. I can hear you now. Yeah, yeah we knock fix it. Yeah, I pushed the wrong button. Um, Okay. So, uh, first of all, fantastic talk. I'm so glad we could share this time with you. Uh, I have this, you know, so, so if this terrible event happens and there's, you know, the biodegradation happens, is what about the having these legions of acclimatized microbes in the water at that point? Uh, is, is that something uh, to be concerned about, or is it just they go away, or or what? Okay, so that's a great question. I think what you're asking is these organisms are going to become present and then what's going to happen to them after they're present, right? Is that it? Right. Yeah. That's okay. it. So what we saw in the Gulf of Mexico is basically the same thing that we've seen in lots of other cases of biodegradation, all right? So the microbes grow, and then when the oil, the biodegradable oil is gone, the microbes die off, all right? It's just like what would happen if we, um, all right, if, if you uh, look at um, a carcass of a whale, and it sinks to the bottom of the ocean. There's a huge amount of activity of organisms that cluster around that carcass, degrade the whale, right? And then once the whale is all gone, those organisms die off because there's no more food. There are not enough food to support them. And that's what happens. Is there any problem from dead dead microbes? So, I mean, <laughs> do they carpet okay. the seafloor in some way or something? Okay. Now, the key thing to think about here is I 
think that what happens is people, um, and, and this is certainly understandable. So when we look at the, let's just look at the deep water horizon as an example. Now remember what the microbes are doing is degrading the dissolved organic, uh, the dissolved molecules or the little tiny droplets of oil. That's what they're degrading. They are not degrading the slick. All right? So what's going to happen is when you get those little tiny droplets or the dissolved compounds, there's not much of it that actually forms these droplets or that dissolves. It's not a huge amount of stuff. So the concentrations did, of microbes are not... About, I was, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no. You go ahead. Go ahead. Well, you, had just, you said that there wasn't, wasn't very much of that stuff, meaning dissolved, you know, dissolved uh, organic compounds. But, I, but in the beginning, your slide said something along the, along the order of, wasn't it 30% of, uh, is, is uh, about how much biodegradation can account for? Yes, yes, it can account for, for about 30%, but that's over a long period of time. Okay? So it's not going to be 30% in 10 days. So when you think about it, it's, it's like this. All right. So we start off, and there's some oil. There's, there's not very much. If you look at the dissolution, let me go way back here. I think to go way back. Yes, let's see the 500 days or something like that for bio degradation. <laughs> Okay, here we go. So if you look at the dissolution, whoops, sorry about this, the dissolution, about 5% of the oil initially goes into the water, all right? That continues off the slick. If the slick is there, it continues and continues, all right? Now, if you think about it, it's like having a, a dosing machine. So the oil spill is there and it acts like a dosing machine, constantly dosing in organic carbon. But not gobs of organic carbon, just slow dissolving of the oil slick into the water. Okay? So it's a very slow input, relatively speaking, for the microbes to degrade. It's not like a giant. Um, it, it's not like a giant pile of easily dissolvable materials. So remember, uh, I think I put it back here, right here. Yeah. So if it was sugar, if we put a pound of sugar in a cup of water and it dissolves, and I start and put some microbes in there, within a few days that thing will be full of microbes, right? Because there's a lot of organic carbon. We put a few in there, they start to eat that sugar up, and as long as we keep supplying oxygen and nutrients, they'll just go chunk, 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 and you'll have a blob of microorganisms in there, okay, in the cup. But look at the concentration of oil into water. It's a microgram. Now, a if we look at a pound, that's 454 grams, just to put this in perspective. If we say <coughs> oil into water, it's one pound of oil into 200, this should be the 300, 200, 300 million gallons of water, which is equivalent to one microgram, one millionth of a gram to a thousand milligrams per liter. It's tiny. It's not very much that goes into solution. And even though it might be a continuous process, it's a very slow and tiny amount. So if you think about this cup having a microgram, a millionth of a gram of oil dissolved 
dissolved in it, available to the microbes, you're not going to see very many microbes, right? It's just a tiny amount. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I think we have this vision that if, if people went down in a little uh, submarine into the oil slick from the Deepwater Horizon, that you were going to see gobs of oil, that it was going to be brown with oil down there. It wasn't, because not very much oil dissolves in water. Now, there was oil in the water, but it wasn't enough to make the water brownish. So yes, there were microbes, but it wasn't enough material to make it, you know, just a thick soup of microbes is what I'm trying to say. Now, it doesn't mean there weren't microbes there, but not a huge number of microbes, not, you know, billions. And um, if I think of this next time, I'll actually bring in some test tubes. Kath, if you write this down, I'll bring in some test tubes next time with different concentrations of microbes in them, and you'll be amazed at, you, you won't be able to see them at, when they're, you know, when they're a million per liter, you wouldn't even see them, because they're so tiny. Okay? We've got five minutes, and they're not kidding. <laughs> okay. So, other other questions. Just one last one. Uh, I haven't had a chance. I don't think some of us have had a chance to attend your previous lectures. Um, uh, just if if we don't have a chance to attend the last one, uh, could you give us a quick summary of the direction that your research is heading in? That is to say. Uh, assuming that we're talking about the various types of, uh, of dispersal and dispersion and so forth, what is its relationship to Arctic um, exploration, uh, potential oil spills, et cetera? Okay. So what I'm going to do, and in fact, what I'm doing next, not next week, the week after, we're having a big, there's a huge conference in the Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative Conference in Mobile. And uh, I'm mediating a, a session on um, the where are we going with the use of dispersants and oil spills. And so I'm going to be talking in the next lecture, of, or in the next talk, about what dispersants are, why we use them, what's natural dispersion versus chemically enhanced dispersion, and how do we actually figure out what the toxicity of dispersants are, how much to apply, all of these kinds of things. I think it's actually going to be two talks, not one, because it's, it's a lot to cover. And, and the key thing is, all of these lectures, and I think the judge was here to hear this before, and David definitely knows, all of these lectures are kept on OWL. The, I'm not sure what that stands for, but um, uh, David knows how to get a hold of it. So if you didn't hear my my talks last March, you can still watch them. And you'll be able to watch the dispersants ones too. Obviously, I won't be able to answer questions live, but um, uh, you'll be able to watch this one too. Okay? Super. Thank you. So I will be on again two weeks from today, same time, uh, and I'll talk, start the talk, and get through as much of it as I can about dispersants, but it may end up being two different talks, because there's a lot to cover, and it's very controversial. What are we looking at in the background there? Is that a lake and a building, or what? Mm -hmm. uh, this, this, this is a blackboard, a whiteboard. Whiteboard. Yes, it's a, it's a whiteboard, so I could actually write on this. Oh, I see. <laughs> okay, I okay. get it. <laughs> yeah. It looks like a lake so, and a shore, and there's a building. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I wish it was, but it's just a whiteboard. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah. It, 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 you could look outside right now and see a white a white out because it was really snowing a little while ago. So anyway. Up here as well. <laughs> yes, I heard that. Except you're much colder. So, yeah. all right. Any other, any other questions? Okay, bye bye. Thank you so Thank much. You. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.